So thank you all so much for joining us for the glories of Newport, a look into these magnificent mansions. Who says we can't dream? This illustrated talk takes us into some of the grandest rooms ever created in this country, a world away yet so close. Fancy tea in a Chinese tea house, not a problem for Mrs. Elva Vanderbilt. Need a spot for 200 dinner guests? Easy if your home is the breakers. Join us on an armchair tour of the finest houses in America. So this program is led by art historian, Mary Woodward, who serves as a guide at several historic New England properties. She previously served as public programs coordinator and educator at the Concord Museum. Mary has a BA in art history from Furman University and an MA in art history from Emory University. She has more than 40 years of experience in museums of all shapes and sizes, from the comprehensive collection at the Cleveland Museum of Art to the one room log cabin birthplace of President James K. Polk. We yep. again thank the Corning Foundation and the Friends of the Tewksbury Library for co-sponsoring, and we thank the libraries in Ashland and North Reading for helping spread the word. So all nearly 250 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Mary for joining us this morning. And Mary, you can take it away. Thanks oh, so much. Thank you so much for that grand introduction, Robert. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak with you all today. Um, and thank you all for joining us from so far flung places. So today we are going to take an in-depth tour of three, that's all we have time for, Newport's biggest and best cottages. We'll look at Marble House, we'll look at the Breakers, and we'll look at the Elms. And we'll peek behind the closed doors at life behind all of that glitter and gilding and see who is there making these homes run smoothly. Along the way, we're going to discover that Newport, Rhode Island, has always been interested in high society. The area that Newport, Rhode Island occupies now, Aquidneck Island, was home to the Narragansett when the first English colonists arrived in 1639 from Boston. They paid the Native Americans in goods for their land, um, but that we know was a concept that wasn't really relatable to the culture of the indigenous peoples. The English residents were independent minded and liberal thinking. The town grew prosperous in the 1600s and 1700s, in part because of its participation in the infamous triangle trade. African slaves were traded to the Americas, slave produced sugar came into New England, and from New England, rum and other goods were shipped to Africa. Newport was a place for privateers as well as pirates, um, but it was also a place where diversity thrived. Jewish merchants and Quakers were welcome to do business there. If I had to sum up early Newport, I would say it was a town of somewhat conflicting agendas. Amidst all of that commerce, there was also a spirit of intellectualism. In 1746, a man named Abraham Redwood, who was one of the largest and wealthiest slave owners in the area, gave money for a library um, that would reflect the diverse interests of the community. And they had books on things like navigation, philosophy. There was how to build, uh, how to brew beer. Uh, there was a book on how to build a privy but there was also a popular 18th century gut etiquette manual. So again, they were interested in society. From uh, by 1774, right before the War for Independence, only 135 years after its founding, Newport, Rhode Island was the country's fifth largest town and it was its most popular resort. It was popular with Southerners, escaping the heat and humidity and the diseases that the bugs carried, like malaria. Uh, and it had Newport Mercury newspaper, which was the first newspaper in America to feature a regular society column. The war for independence was hard on the town and the residents of Newport. In fact, the town didn't really start to recover until the 1820s when Southerners began to return after that war, along with tourists from neighboring states. 
Some of them rented houses for the summer and they began to buy lots of land to build their own. But these were not the glitzy McMansions. These were people yearning for the country life, like you see in this one here, Kingscott. Uh, they were yearning for pastoral outings to local farms, and they yearned to sit on long verandas and catch the ocean breezes. Naturally, big hotels followed as well for the people who weren't building their own homes. And with all of this tourist population, an influx of gossip columnists from the big city papers keeping tabs on all those rich and famous. In, in 1839, the same year that King's caught the ha a house there is pictured there, an enterprising young man named Alfred Smith had a notion that these wealthy tourists, the really wealthy ones, might want to start building their own homes. And he wanted to take advantage of that. So he bought large undeveloped areas south of town and began selling big lots of land. Well, what he really needed was a road to go down there. And so Bellevue Avenue was created. It's very wide and lined with beautiful trees like a broad Parisian boulevard. Deborah Davis is the author of a book called Gilded, How Newport Became America's Richest Resort. And she notes that when Newport's physical landscape began to change, when roads were put in to the other parts of the island and big lots of land were developed, the city's social climate changed along with it. Little old friendly Newport, known for its relaxed pace and its kind of country pleasures, was invaded by new people with a new agenda. So another substitute uh, subtitle really that I considered for this talk was a, a phrase that reappeared in several sources and it was called, a, it was said, a rush to opulence, uh, which really I think describes what we're about to talk about. Someone also came up with the very fun expression to describe the kind of competitive construction that we're going to look at today um, as Vanderbilding. So, if you've been with me before on a talk for, say, the Gilded Age of Isabella Stewart Gardner, then you've seen this image before. It's a caricature of Mark Twain. He and Charles Dudley Warner published a book in 1873 called The Gilded Age, A Tale of Today. The book's topic was about the politics of the day, but the author's views are easily translatable to the social life of the times. For Mark Twain, this time period was not a golden age, like the golden age of Athens or Rome. It was a gilded age. It was a thin veneer of a shiny surface that was covering what he considered a rotten interior. The title was inspired, the gilded age, by lines from Shakespeare's play King John, where a wise character observes, to gild refined gold, to paint the lily, is wasteful and ridiculous excess. The gilded lily, these folks, these new folks liked gilded lilies. Uh, to them, they might have found them more beautiful than nature's own creation. So historians differ on the exact dates to assign to the Gilded Age, but generally people agree that it began at the end of the Civil War in 1865 and went on at least to the end of the century. Some suggest it was still going strong in 1912 until the sinking of the Titanic. Not only did a number of Newport uh, residents lose their lives that night, uh, but the tragedy of uh, brought home the truism that no matter who you are or how much money you have, you can't live forever. Between the Titanic in 1912 and the institution of the personal income tax in 1913, those things spelled the end of the Gilded Age. It was a period of this concentrated wealth and rapid industrialization. These captains of new expanding industries like steel, railroads, coal, banking, they were helped along in some cases by political corruption, by kickbacks, and by the labor of immigrants. As these newly rich saw their wealth grow, as one author said, exponentially, uh, the model they took for expressing that wealth and status 
Uh, they looked to European history and particularly English aristocracy, so uh, or European aristocracy. So think people like the Medici or uh, say King Louis the Fourteenth or Fifteenth or Sixteenth of France. Also, I want to say, if you've watched uh, HBO's The Gilded Age, you're going to see, you, you, you're watching what happened in society, first in New York City and then in Newport. The new people didn't come from old money. They were the recently rich. And so they didn't have the manners and the rules and the right and the wrong way to proceed in society. But there was one woman who led the way in New York society, and that was Caroline Astor, the Mrs. Astor. Since controlling society seemed to be her self-appointed job, she thought she ought to go to Newport for the summer season and exercise her control there. In 1881, she bought Beechwood, an Italian palazzo that had been built about 30 years earlier. Naturally, of course, it needed expanding for Mrs. Astor because, you know, for one thing, it didn't have a big enough ballroom. Um, today, as a matter of fact, it's a private residence. It's owned by Larry Ellison of Oracle. Um, the locals rumor that they've he's already spent about $100 million on its renovation. The person to challenge Mrs. Astor's supremacy was born Alva Smith in Mobile, Alabama. She was the daughter of a cotton plantation owner, and she's been described as the original steel magnolia, refined, determined, and tough. Before the Civil War, her family was used to summering in Newport, Rhode Island. She married William K. Vanderbilt, who was a grandson of Commodore Vanderbilt, and they had a daughter and two sons. She's pictured here dressed for a masquerade ball that she hosted for a thousand guests or so at their New York City home in 1883. Once Alva Vanderbilt could say that she had broken into New York society, she set her sights on Newport society, where Mrs. Astor ruled as well. Her opening salvo in this mission took the form of Marble House. Alva was knowledgeable about architecture, and she hired Richard Morris Hunt, who'd built their New York City home. Hunt was the first American trained at the, fan, at the very premier Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. He was, it helped, familiar with palace and chateau design. Some clients gave Hunt a run for his money, and Alva Vanderbilt was one of them. They had matching fiery tempers, it was said. Damn it, Mrs. Vanderbilt, who is building this house? He asked, to which she replied, damn it, Mr. Hunt, who's going to live in the house? Marble House, finished in 1892, was given as a gift to Alva by her husband, William, as a 39th birthday gift. When it was opened, it was considered the most lavish house in America, says the Preservation Society of Newport, who manages the house. The exterior is clad in white marble, inside many richly colored marbles, which we're about to see, and lots and lots of gilding. There's about 500,000 cubic feet of marble inside and out. It reportedly cost 11 million dollars uh, to build. Uh, in today's money, it's about $260 million. And it was nothing like Newport had ever seen when it was unveiled in August of 1892. While it had been under construction, there were high fences that kept the curious from seeing what was going on. It was like a fourth child to me, Alva said about the house. It's been described as the Petit Trianon at Versailles meets the White House. It was an instant triumph for Richard Morris Hunt and became a masterpiece of American Renaissance. It boasts 50 rooms and giant Corinthian columns, which you see there on the front, and then these massive bronze doors weighing more than 10 tons get you inside the house. Once you're inside, visitors could take in the warm, yellowy Siena marble of the entrance hall. The Preservation Society offers this description. I couldn't do any better. They say, 
It's like an enormous, beautifully crafted jewel box, miraculously set down on a cliff by the sea. Pink marble from Algeria covers the walls of the dining room. According to the Preservation Society, the velvet covered chairs were made of bronze covered in gold. The side chairs weigh about 75 pounds and the armchairs weigh about 100 pounds. Um, so you would need a footman's help to scooch up to the table and then scoot away from the table. Alva ate lunch here with her children every day, speaking only French and um, serving them a little wine with their lunch. In the old European tradition, there are elements of the hunt in the room. So way up high at the corners of the room, you have stag's head, gilded stag's heads in relief. Um, and everywhere else in the house, there are also reminders that we are by the seaside with whimsical shells and dolphins carved into uh, door handles, for instance, and furniture. Uh, by the way, the Vanderbilts, because they were the new people, did something else new. They decided to serve their guests in a new fashion. Instead of the service a la Francaise, where all the dishes are served at once and piled up high on the tables and the sideboards, they chose service a la Russe, which was one course at a time. And it could be about eight to 12 courses for a meal. Uh, oysters, then soup, then side dish, then your fish, then your meat, then uh, some vegetables with that, an entree, and then perhaps cold dishes, and then dessert at the end. Um, but don't worry, diners weren't really expected to finish each course because as soon as the last person was served, the next courses started coming out. So uh, people actually ate very little um, and food was going very quickly, coming and going. It was really must have been quite a spectacle. Now, this spectacular room is called the Gothic Room for its obvious display of Gothic style um, fittings and windows. It was designed to display a collection of medieval artifacts that, and Alva, um, wanting to get to the finish line faster, didn't just uh, slowly collect medieval things. Uh, she just bought somebody else's collection of medieval art and began with a fully formed collection. Uh, the fireplace in this room is a stone, beautifully intricately carved fireplace that is an antique itself. It's from a French chateau dating to the 1400s. And remember the look of this room because we're going to talk about it again in a few minutes. The gold ballroom at the Marble House has been described as the most ornate room in Newport. And I'm going to certainly say it's the goldest. <laughs> the walls are covered in 22 karat gold leaf and colored marbles here and there. Um, the room is set up here as a salon, as you see furniture in the middle of the room, but uh, the furniture moved away. It becomes a sumptuous ballroom. And it needed to be spectacular because it was here in August of 1895 that Alva held a ball in honor of the Charles Spencer Churchill, the visiting ninth Duke of Marlborough. Uh, the room was packed with 300 guests. The room was ablaze with those newfangled electric lights uh, and the party lasted until 5 a.m. Uh, and by the way, you'll see in this picture, you see the lights clustered together and you'll see it in other light fixtures. That's because their light bulbs only put out about 10 watts of light versus our 60 or so. Uh, the ball was meant to encourage the Duke's interest and attentions towards Alva's daughter, Consuelo. And indeed, the plan worked. The couple were engaged soon afterwards. Now, speaking of Consuela, um, this bedroom on the left, that doesn't look like a teenage girl's bedroom, does it? No, but sadly, it was Consuela's teenage bedroom. Um, in fact, the producers of the Gilded Age agree, and they cast it as the room for the fictional Mr. Russell, who basically is playing a character like her father, William Vanderbilt. Um, Consuela was a renowned beauty of her day with the long swan neck like uh, swan like neck rather everybody talks about it and uh, and a very large inheritance. 
Alva, the mother, designed this room down to the knickknacks there um, and really didn't want Consuelo putting her own stuff and laying it about the way a teenage daughter would do. So mom was uh, extremely controlling, to say the least. Um, and, but Alva did succeed in ar arranging her daughter's marriage into British society. Um, but it was not a love match. Each of the two were in love with someone else. Uh, and it's an early example of the American dollar princesses marrying into the aristoc uh, aristocracy, either European or English, uh, who usually needed money to help sustain their inherited lifestyle. So if you've seen Downton Abbey, you know how that story starts. Um, this marrying into aristocracy became a bit of a competitive practice, just like the house building. Um, dukes were pretty, very high up that social scale there. And so um, he was quite a catch. They were engaged in the Gothic room that we just saw downstairs. She was 18. He was about 26. She reluctantly agreed. Uh, and he got $10 million right away. Uh, it was an unhappy marriage. And after 26 years, their marriage was annulled. The Duke wasn't out of money, though. He received a private income of two and a half million dollars for the rest of her life from Consuelo's fortune. Now, the same year that Alva managed to get her daughter Consuelo married into aristocracy, Alva divorced her husband William on grounds of adultery. Divorce was considered uh, rather scandalous and I'm going to say especially for the woman divorcing the man, um, but she wanted women to have the courage to do this, and she felt compelled to set an example. Alva held on. She kept Marble House because it had been a gift to her uh, after the divorce, and, and using it, as the Preservation Society says, as a very elaborate spare closet. William Vanderbilt, her now ex-husband, only ever spent two summers at uh, Marble House. As Alva aged, she became more involved in women's suffragette movement. She saw her own divorce and her daughter's annulment as ways of empowering women to improve their lives and leave unhappy marriages. In 1914, she hosted the Conference of Great Women at Marble House, and here's an image of Consuelo speaking from the garden terraces. Alva gave financial support to a number of women's organizations. She served on the boards of them, and she was elected president of the National Women's Party in 1921. Uh, when the 19th Amendment, by the way, votes for women, was passed in 1920. Now, the Vanderbilts had, besides the beautiful terraces in the back of the house, well, they had another very special place for outdoor gatherings set at the far end of their lawn, close to the sea, the Chinese Tea House. It was designed by Richard Morris Hunt's sons, who, imagine, went all the way to China for inspiration. Um, it was built in 1913. That was, must have been quite a trip. Uh, it's a long way from the house to the tea house, and the tea house was built without a kitchen of its own. Uh, but that's no problem because the staff would lay down a small gauge railway uh, and carts containing food, and some said even the butler riding in one, would be rolled out the lawn into the tea house so that they could prepare their meals there. And uh, then the tracks would be taken up quickly so that the guests wouldn't see how it took how, what, what it took to create a meal in the tea house. So you could say it was just magic as far as the guests were concerned. And magic plays a large part in what we'll see in the next house as well. Because not to be outdone by his younger brother's home marble house, Cornelius Vanderbilt II and his wife Alice began building the breakers in the spring of 1893. And it was completed just two years later. It replaced a smaller wooden house that had burned down the year before. Determined not to let that happen again, the Breakers was going to be entirely fireproof. Um, it has a steel skeleton instead of a wooden frame. The walls are brick and concrete at their core. There are heavy fire doors on the kitchen, and the house's boilers were buried several hundred feet away from the house. Uh, here, by the way, is a picture of Mrs. 
Alice Vanderbilt going to that very, her sister-in-law, Alva's masquerade ball in New York City in 1883. And I, I might have been a tad bit of a competition between the women, I think, as well, because she um, hands down won the wore the most unusual outfit. Um, Mrs. Alice Vanderbilt came as an electric light. She came as a in a battery powered dress that lit up and sparkled, and then she held aloft an actual light. So uh, just a little bit of one-upmanship there. Mrs. Ann Alice Vanderbilt, by the way, for those of us who, who are interested in bringing it into the modern world, um, she's Anderson Cooper's great-grandmother. That's the relationship. So Richard Morris Hunt was called in to design what became a 70-room Italian Renaissance palazzo with open-air courtyards overlooking the Atlantic Ocean instead of the Italian countryside. It comes in at 138,000 square feet, just a little over 138,000 square feet with 300 windows. Uh, the house itself takes up nearly an acre of the land. The New York Times said the breakers outranks any private residence in the world. That's what they said when it was built. It was one of Richard Morris Hunt's last and greatest creations. Now, keep in mind that the season in Newport, the time that these homes would be occupied by the Vanderbilts, uh, was uh, about six to eight weeks in the summer. That was it. And even less so really for the men, because the men were often only there on the weekends. Now, everything at the Breakers is supersized, starting with the 30 foot high wrought iron gates with CV. Cornelius Vanderbilt, written in the crest up there. The Vanderbilts combined their housewarming party in August of 1895 with their daughter Gertrude's coming out party. And even though it's an enormous house, the Preservation Society notes that, you know, it's a family house as well, and scores of children and grandchildren rode their bikes and trikes around on the great hall, floor of the great hall, and, and slid down these beautiful stairs on, on trays. Okay, they were silver monogrammed Vanderbilt trays, but they, they had fun. They played in the house. Um, the, the house and the scale of it uh, were meant to mirror the Vanderbilts' success. Um, they had power and wealth, and the house should look like that. In his 1899 book called The Theory of the Leisure Class, uh, Thorstein Veblen, an economist, identified the behavioral characteristics of the nouveau riche and coined the term conspicuous consumption. And we're looking at it right there. Sadly, Cornelius Vanderbilt II wasn't around to enjoy life at the Breakers very long. He had a stroke a year after the house was built, and he died four years later, just shy of his 56th birthday. As you step in to the Breakers, into the Great Hall, you are in a room that is a cube. It's 50 feet by 50 feet by 50 feet tall. The ceiling features the faux painted sky as if we're looking up through an enormous opening where, as you can tell, it's always sunny and pleasant. The doors at the far side of the hall, and you see them on the two floors on the left side there, you see daylight coming in. Those could be opened out to verandas and sea breeze would fill this large space as guests enjoyed their evening festivities. Next door in the dining room, you could seat 39 when the long table was in place. In that dining room on the left, there are 12 tall rose-colored alabaster columns supporting the ceiling. And on the ceiling, a beautiful painting featuring Aurora, goddess of the dawn. And the house faces the east, it's, it's, so it's, it's beautiful. Well, the back of the house faces the east. The room was lit by 12 wall sconces, but what really catches your attention are the two French Baccarat crystal chandeliers hanging in the middle of the room. They are both electrified as well as plumbed for gas. Electricity was new and it was somewhat unreliable and iffy, 
So the Vanderbilts wanted to be sure that they could see during their dinner parties. So they were plumbed for gas or could use electricity no matter what was um, on offer at the time. And on the right there, I just included a photo of um, the Opera House in Paris, uh, the Palais Garnier, as it's known, uh, just to show you how closely influenced the Vanderbilts were uh, by contemporary European architecture. This room was finished in 1875, so not that long before they built the breakers. Now, whereas the dining room is all French feeling, Richard Morris Hunt used the rounded arches and the vaulted ceiling to give the billiards room more of an ancient feeling, an ancient Roman feeling, luxurious, nevertheless. The walls are covered in colored alabasters. There were gray greens and yellowy reds. And there's this huge light fixture. You see it hanging over the billiards table. It's made of wrought iron and bronze. It was so heavy, it had to be attached to the structural beams because of its weight. Now, the mosaic floor in the room is so charming, it features an acorn design, and that's a symbol of the Vanderbilt family, strength, longevity. In the HBO series, and if you haven't watched it yet, get out there and watch it if you can, um, you can see actors playing billiards on the actual table in that room, um, and one of the guards said that they, they put a temporary felt on top of the antique felt top, but that even still the actors were very, very careful about um, shooting pool on that, shooting billiard balls all over that table. Now, we're back to over the top French. It continued in the music room, which was a scene for many important family events like debutante coming out parties and then the subsequent weddings. Silver and gold leaf decorate the ceiling, gild the ceiling, and blue marble surrounds the fireplace. The furnishings, and let me close in on detail of the furnishings. The furnishings were designed and constructed in France and uh, shipped here and then re you know, installed in the room. Uh, again, if you've watched The Gilded Age, this room is the scene of the young Russell daughter's ball. This is where the Vanderbilt's own daughter, Gertrude, uh, married Henry, Harry Whitney the year after her debut. Gertrude was an accomplished sculptor, as well as the founder of the Whitney Museum in uh, New York City in 1931. We have a completely different feel for the room on the left, which is the library adjacent. It's a warm and cozy space. It has a heavy coffered wooden ceiling, uh, well, made to look like wooden ceiling, uh, gold embossed leather and walnut cabinets. It's very, very masculine in this space. The main feature of the space really is a 16th century fireplace, stone fireplace, which you see there from a French chateau. And it has a carving on it that um, must have been very significant to Mr. Vanderbilt. And it's been, it's been um, transcribed this way, uh, translated. It says, I laugh, I laugh at great wealth and never miss it. Nothing but wisdom matters in the end. So when you go upstairs in the private areas of uh, any of these homes, and especially see it here in the breakers, um, you'll notice a change in the decoration. It's much less over the top Renaissance and Baroque, and it's far more restrained, calm, and classical, and even the color palette is more subdued. As you can see on the right there, these interiors at the Breakers were the work of architect and designer Ogden Cobman Jr. Uh, he was the oldest son in the last generation of the Cobmans who lived at the Cobman Estate in Lincoln, Massachusetts, which is a historic New England property. He owned an office of architectural and interior design in Newport, and it was there that he met Edith Wharton, who wasn't yet um, the famous author that we know her for to be. He and Edith Wharton co-wrote an influential book called The Decoration of Houses, published in 1897, and it became the how-to manual for interior decoration for decades. 
Edith Wharton was raised in this wealthy society moving between Newport and New York City. Um, her father, George Jones, and her family lived the good life. And in fact, um, this Jones family, Edith Wharton's family, um, was said to be the one who inspired the saying, keeping up with the Joneses. Now, you can see Mr. Vanderbilt's bedroom here on the right with a modest set of uh, walnut furniture and Louis XIV style. He commanded a fortune of $75 million, but he was a quiet and unassuming man who taught Sunday school. He was devoted to hard work. But they added a special luxury into the Biltmore, I mean, into the Breakers. There are 20 bathrooms in the house. Um, and, and these usually houses at the time, if you were lucky, had one, uh, but they have 20 in the house and, and they are really spacious. <laughs> this marble tub, for instance, on the left there has four taps. You can see them on the edge there. And that's uh, for hot and cold fresh water and hot and cold sea water for your bath time pleasure. Here's a view on the right of uh, Mrs. Vanderbilt's nightstand. And you can see a row of call buttons there and an intercom phone used to call the staff so that they could respond to her every need. And here is where the other end of that system comes out, speaking tubes in the servants area of the house. So we're going to continue our look at the breakers behind the scenes in the domain of the staff. They had a staff of 40 for the house and the grounds. There were 33 bedrooms on the upper floor for the household staff. And the household staff would be the people who would travel with them from New York to Newport and back for the season. Gardeners and caretakers generally lived in Newport and wouldn't travel. They would just wait for the next summer season to roll around. The kitchen at the Breakers features a work table covered in zinc, which was what they used before stainless steel came into use. And the cast iron stove, which you see there on the far left, is 21 feet long and could be heated by both coal and wood. The family's silver was kept through this wooden door, rather in a, uh, inconspicuous wooden door there with the combination lock on it. Um, and it, the silver vault had to, had to be large. They had a thousand piece set of monogrammed Tiffany silver to put af to look after, and it was the butler's job to protect the silver. Um, and here's the enunciator, those machines <laughs> which we would the staff could look up at and they could see which room was calling for help and they would know where to head out to get give assistance. So the last is a view of the exterior of the breakers and um, architectural critics generally think this is really the best side. This is the seaside facing here. And we're gonna leave the breakers then. And lastly for today, we're gonna skip across the street and up a bit to the Elms. The Elms was built for Mr. and Mrs. Edward Berman, Berwin rather from Philadelphia, Edwin, Edward Berwin. In 1875, Mr. Berwind and his brother began their coal business. And by 1904, not even 30 years later, the U.S. was producing two thirds of the world's coal. And guess which company was the largest owner of coal properties in the U.S.? The Berwins. He was named a Chevalier or from the Legion of Honor in France for supplying coal to the entire country of France during World War I. Berwyn's coal fueled the New York subway, the Vanderbilt railroads, and the U.S. Navy. And unlike the other men that we've talked about at the other two houses, Edward Berwyn enjoyed, uh, lived to enjoy life at the Elms until his death in 1936. He hired Horace Trumbauer, not Richard Morris Hunt, to design and build this French-inspired home. The architect Trumbauer had never even been to Europe. He had no formal training at all, but had learned everything on the job in an architectural firm in Philadelphia. But he had studied books and prints, and he, in fact, 
modeled the elms on an actual 18th century chateau outside of Paris. And I think that you can, that's the picture at the bottom. And I think you can see the strong similarity in those two garden views, uh, the garden side of the elms and the Chateau Dessinières. Uh, the elms was constructed for 1.4 million, which would be about $28 million today, but that included 13 acres, the purchase price of 13 acres of land. Horace Trumbauer, the architect, was unapologetic in his approach to building these huge homes. He told one prospective client, if money bothers you, then I'm not your architect. Now, earlier, I mentioned that the first large houses built by seasonal visitors were on the smaller scale. They were wooden houses in pastoral country settings. Here is a fuzzy photo, my apologies, of the first elms that the Berwins bought in 1888. It's a modest Victorian two-story house. It's a real cottage, if you will, uh, and they lived there on about one-third of an acre, but they began buying neighboring lots and demolishing older homes in order to build their dream house. What they built was still referred to as a cottage, to quote Deborah Davis again, that's a quaint euphemism. It was a throwback to the days when Newport had simple beach houses instead of English, French, and Italianate palaces. But that's exactly what they got. It's a dazzling white palace in the French Renaissance style. The Elms has seven bedrooms and six bathrooms in 60,000 square feet, which makes it about half the size of the breakers. But that's okay, plenty of room. The Berwins were admirers of French historical styles. We can spot those elements as soon as we come in through the entrance doors. The walls are clad in white veined marble and their elegant flying staircases, which feature these beautifully wrought iron curvilinear rails. Guests were treated to 47 rooms of exquisite art and furnishings set inside an elegant white glittering confection of a house. The interiors were, uh, were designed and created in France by a man named Jules Allard of Paris, who, who also worked at Marble House and at the Breakers. He was more than just an interior designer. He really advised these Americans on the way to live with these beautiful historic French styles. Now, the drawing room at the Elms is a feminine pastel space. There's a light breezy feeling to the room. The ceiling painting is an 18th century Dutch work featuring dawn chasing away darkness, similar theme to what we saw at the breakers. The doors on either side of the room can be opened to allow guests to drift seamlessly between the entrance hall, which you see there in the distance where the daylight's coming in, into the drawing room where we are, and out the left side uh, of this picture to the garden terrace. Uh, and there were also doors that passed between all the garden facing rooms so that guests could simply progress from one opulent space to the next. This was a party house and it was an instant um, museum for their art collection. The doors of the ballroom in the next room over, which is one of the doors you see featured here in this photo, open onto the garden terrace. And on the night of April 30th, I'm sorry, August 30th, 1901, at their housewarming party, 400 guests arrived to see live trees and vines and roses all over that beautiful entrance hall. And then as they went into the ballroom and the party spilled out through these doorways onto the lawn, there they were entertained by troops of trained monkeys. Of course, um, the house was completely electrified and there are more than 1500 electric lights inside the elms. And there's a close up of one of the elegant sconces in the ballroom. Next to the ballroom, you've got your breakfast room, which is just a jewel box of a room with walls covered in 18th century Kanshi lacquer 
panels from China. They, uh, this is just a unique and sparkling sort of space. The room has been described really as one of the few surviving lacquer rooms in the world. It's really exquisite. Um, and, and now as an introduction to the servants parts of the house, here I offer you a compare and contrast slide. On the left, the wide glittering marble halls that the guests and the Berwins would use to move from floor to floor inside the elms. And on the right, a photo of an interior concealed hallway between bedrooms that the staff would use for carrying laundry, for bringing out meal trays, for cleaning, carrying tools to clean and remove trash. The most important aspect of the staff at these big homes was their ability to remain invisible to the family um, and their guests. These massive cottages should look as though they ran themselves by magic. Uh, and in fact, when we're about to visit now the kitchens and the servants' bedrooms and boiler rooms, uh, we're gonna be going into places that the owners didn't really venture. Now, if there was an award for the most beautiful pantry, butler's pantry, this one would have my vote. This elegant two-story room was used to plate the food that came up in an electric dumbwaiter from the kitchen below. Uh, and that actually was the fastest way to travel between these two levels. They said that even the, um, the uh, waiters, uh, the footmen and all might get in the dumbwaiter to move up and down. Uh, this upper level that you see on the right has uh, cabinets for storing dishes. It's also where the silver safe was. And in the level below was the kitchen. Now the ideal chef, for these families was French, and those chefs could command top dollar prices, salaries. For example, the chefs at Marble House and the chef at the Breaker got $10,000 a year. Um, that's way out of scale for the rest of the senior staff. That's almost 10 times what the butler would get, the next highest paid person on the staff. The kitchen at the Elms is a huge space, and it's divided into the cold kitchen and then the hot kitchen. Uh, in the Gilded Age, you saw the cold kitchen, which is in these slides, um, as a spot for plating the food and a place for the staff to gather and wait for their next assignment. Um, the enunciator is the box on the upper right there, and they would watch that and, and see it flip over and know that they needed to go to the drawing room, for instance. Uh, but it's a light and airy and large space, and that's in keeping with some new theories that we're developing about improving the work environments for these household staff. Through the glass dividing doors on the other side, the hot side of the kitchen, the massive stove is coal fired naturally. You'll notice those large copper pots. If you look at the one all the way to the left, the really biggest one, by the time it was filled with soup and they said it could be, it could hold probably 80 servings of soup. That's too heavy for anyone to move. So they put spigots on them. That's how they would use those. Um, they were in, they were preparing food on an industrial scale. The kitchens would feed at least 50 people a day. And of course, hundreds more when there were balls and galas. Uh, in front of you, that marble block is the mortar. And sitting in front of it looking like a dumbbell is the pestle. So things were on a big scale there. Let's look here at um, an exterior view of the house. It looks like a two-story house, uh, but the truth is there are really five and a half floors in there. Uh, much of the top levels are hidden from our view by that parapet or that wall that goes along the roof line. And um, the stairs that the servants would take up and down are featured there on the right. And again, they're very bright and open and airy. As I mentioned a minute ago, it was the prime responsibility for the household staff to do their job and be invisible at it. Um, we were told on the backstairs tour that, uh, that I took that a maid could work for 20 years and never meet her employer. So learning staff's names was pretty unlikely, really. Um, they, uh, the owners of these houses tended to go with cultural stereotypes. So your Irish maid might just be called Bridget while she was at work, no matter what her real name was. 
There was, of course, a social hierarchy among the household staff. The senior level servants would be known to their employers, of course, um, the butler, the housekeeper, the chef, and the superintendent, who was sort of the man in charge of buildings and grounds. Um, the ideal butlers were English. They were large and imposing men with perfect diction. One author says another important skill for a butler was the ability to feign disinterest in absolutely everything. That's because he was hearing everything that was going on. Another author said, and I love this one, I think this was, uh, again, Miss Davis, she said, um, essentially, he was the perfect surrogate husband. He looked dignified. He was always home. And his answer to every request was an obliging, yes, ma'am. At the Elms, Butler Ernest Birch, and you see him there seated in the middle, traveled with the family to New York, from New York to Newport, along with that household staff. His wife, Grace, worked as a cook at the Elms. They lived in a cottage behind the Elms and had an annual salary of maybe not even $2,000. Uh, but when Mr. Berwin died, he bequeathed $5,000 gift to Ernest Birch, his butler. Upstairs in the servants' area, there are 16 bedrooms and three bathrooms for the servants. At the Elms, the male and female servants lived in close proximity, but married servants weren't allowed to live in the house. Uh, the servants who were there, the household servants, had plain but pleasant bedrooms with locks on the doors, so they had privacy. They didn't have any views out their windows, though, as you can see, because of that parapet, that wall, um, but big spacious bathrooms. And here's a, a rundown of the kind of staff that you would have at the Elms. The housekeeper was the highest ranking female servant and one of her jobs was to secure the linen in the house, the way that the butler secured the silver, then the linen needed securing and protecting and counting. The maids and the laundresses who were handling the linen, and it could be linen clothing, and it could be linen table linens, um, had to be very honest because actually these linen pieces might cost as much as a maid's yearly salary. And so the housekeeper was in charge of keeping count to make sure nothing was taken. Since coal was Mr. Berwin's business, he made sure he had the best way of bringing it into the house. He had a small railroad laid down to accommodate coal wagons, and the railroad goes underground out the side of the house to an adjacent street to avoid dust and dirt and uh, coming in from coal deliveries and coming anywhere near the beautiful parts of his house. Now, sadly, the elms uh, doesn't have any more of its really old elm trees due to Dutch elm disease, but they are trying to plant new disease resistant ones. They do, however, have some of these amazing weeping beeches on their property. They had a staff of 12 working as groundskeepers, and some have said that because they weren't on a seaside location, they put extra effort into the grounds, but they had terraces and lawns, European sculptures and fountains, and these mag a pair of these magnificent pavilions, one of which you see over here on the right. So in conclusion, we may feel about these cottages the way that the author Henry James did in 1907 when he referred to them as white elephants. Alistair Cook, the British American journalist summed it up kind of wryly, I thought. He said 100 years after the declaration that all men were created equal, there began to gather in Newport a colony of the rich determined to show that some Americans were conspicuously more equal than others. The Preservation Society of Newport County, who manages 11 of these properties, um, feels these houses have merit, and I agree, as time capsules of a period of American opulence and overabundance, perhaps, of, of exquisite creations and somewhat excessive grandeur. Personally, I'm grateful that these places were mine for us to while away a day in, dreaming of the glories that were once Newport. So with that, I will um, end and uh, happy to answer any questions if I can or listen to your comments. Thank you. Uh, wonderful job, Mary, as always. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, folks, uh, please, first of all, Mary, wonderful job. You wrapped up right on time. Uh, so let's, let's take uh, roughly uh, 15 minutes or so of questions. 
Uh, we have a comment from Barbara. I deeply appreciate the historic context of this talk, Thank especially you. on women's rights. Yes. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Yes. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, um, we, we can't, we, I didn't want to think of them as the idle rich. Uh, these women were were very wealthy and Newport, everyone talks about how Newport was really a woman run community, but these women did amazing things for, um, for the greater good. So that's nice too. Thank you. Uh, Kay says this was well done. Jane says, thank you. So interesting. Uh, C uh, says she loved this talk. Thank you to Mary and to Tewksbury. Teresa says, wow, fantastic presentation today. Angelina says, very informative, thank you. Uh, Nancy would like to know, in the photo of the Breakers dining room, yep. what was the picture next to it, the, the European place? It, it was, it is the Paris, uh, it's the Opera House, which is known as the Palais Garnier in Paris, France. So it was, um, and it was only completed um, uh, a decade or so before they built the breakers. Well, maybe two decades before. Uh, so it's that sort of richness and opulence, but that's the, that's the opera house in Paris. You can see that just like that still today. Uh, Nancy asks, uh, did the Astors have a home in Newport? They did. They had Beechwood, which was um, the Italianate um, I can go back if you don't mind whiplash. Um, I know it just like it's uh, you're we are unable to go into it because it is privately owned. It's the one that I said was owned by uh, Larry Ellison and um, the it, it, it doesn't really look quite like that. Oops, there we go. Well, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the. Uh, whiplashing oh my computer is now tired of doing that anyway it doesn't really uh it's under massive renovation he bought it for um something like 10 million but has put 100 million into it or something like that there we go uh so it looks like a plain jane sort of um in this photo because look at the date it was actually constructed 1852 you see this was uh um 30 years before the really massive opulent looking homes were being built and uh and it looks even different more different today uh while it's being reconstructed so i i don't he says he's going to make it into a museum but he's owned it for 10 years now i think so i'm not sure that's going to happen uh virginia says many thanks uh, your talk was thoroughly enjoyable uh, an anonymous attendee asks, how much does it cost to maintain all these mansions and how is that funded? Good question. Thank you for asking. So 11 of these properties are maintained by um, the Preservation Society of Newport County. And when you get, when Robert sends you your references, if you want to look up more things, they, I've put their website on. They operate them. So they are in part maintained by entrance fees, um, somewhere between $25 and $29 to visit each house unless you are plan ahead and, and purchase a, a two or three property ticket. Uh, so they it's a kind of steep, um, but you know, once you see inside and you see what they have to um, what they have to take care of, you can totally understand. Uh, so it's entrance fees. Uh, and I'm sure that um, a, a lot of fabulous donations come as well, but it's the Preservation Society of Newport County, which began saving these homes, really some of them from destruction in the early 1960s. Um, the last one we looked at, the Elms, was within days of being demolished before the Preservation Society was able to um, buy it back from the developers who had purchased it from the, um, the you know relatives of the last descendants. So they snatched it away. Uh, Lee says this was wonderful. Uh, an anonymous attendee wants to know, are any movies still filmed in these Newport That's mansions? Amazing. The last one I recall was The Great Gatsby with Robert yes. Redford. Yes, that's right. And I think that was in part filmed. Some of that was filmed at Rosecliff, which is one we didn't look at today. Um, yes, movies are being filmed here all the time. And um, what I included, let me just go to one of the breakers shots, um, was the fact that they are still being used. There's a still off of my photo, uh, TV, which is why it's wonky, of HBO's series, The Gilded Age. 
And um, they are being filmed there. And if you go to these homes and you talk to the guides that are in the rooms and the guards who are standing around, they have wonderful stories of what it's like to have the actors and the production crews there. Um, so it's very fun. And they, they always, I always recommend talking to the room guards and things because they really see it all and they, they know so much more than people ask them about. So, but yeah, so, they're still being used today. Speaking of Rosecliff, uh, June would like to know what's the possibility of another program on more of these cottages? I agree. Let's do that. Let's do it. Let's do, uh, I can I can definitely do that because there are, as she points out, there's several others uh, to be seen and they, uh, Rosecliff is one of these glossy, uh, glittering ones, uh, but there are some in other architectural styles. There's some of the ones that were built in the 1850s and 60s uh, and even 30s like Kingscott that um, are open to the public from time to time. So I will make it my mission to um, try to get into as many of those as I can and we can have Newport 2.0, part two. There we go. Barbara would like to know what would be the best tour to take for these mansions? Do you recommend any particular tours, Mary? Oh, well, the good thing about it is, Barbara, that um, when you go, there are, um, a, there. I'll just do an ad for them right now. The Preservation Society of Newport County has an app. And if you have a smartphone and download your app, it is an audio tour that you can listen to, bring your earbuds or your, I'm a, I'm a, I have to have the wired ear things, but anyway, um, you can take yourself around, but they provide you with the most amazing information. So not only is there an audio tour you can listen to, stop and start, room to room, but there's beautiful printed guides for each of them. And I should say they offer two special, um, they offer a tour that's beneath the breakers, which um, I have not been on. It's kind of like, see the giant boilers, see the, you know, this and that. Um, well, the boilers are actually not beneath the breakers, but see the workings. Um, I did go on the Elms servant tour, and that's why we saw some of the servants' bedrooms and things. That's not uh, on a play regular um regularly open but the Newport Society uh, the Preservation Society of Newport County excuse me their website is newportmansions.org and um, you don't even have to be there to download the app you could listen to it in the comfort of your own house <laughs> uh, an anonymous attendee asks how far away are the three homes that you showed us uh, from one another uh, less than half a mile <laughs> about three minutes walk, four minutes walking. They're all really, most of them are up and down Bellevue Avenue. A few of them are further afield. Um, one that does not belong to the Preservation, Preservation Society is Doris Duke's home called Rough Point, and it's way out at the coast, a little further away. Um, but they're all, they're all very close together. And Here's the lovely part. The, um, the ones that are maintained by the Preservation Society have parking lots at them. So if you've been to Newport, Rhode Island, uh, and the downtown businessy area is, uh, a, you know, it's a colonial town with cobblestone streets and wobbly roads. But out in this section, you have that great big beautiful Bellevue Avenue. Uh, and the houses um, have parking with them as well. So it's, it's really... Um, convenient way to visit. Uh, so Joan says this was so interesting. April says, thank you. Uh, I love the Gilded Age. And today I learned several new things and saw photos I've never seen previously. Good, thank Frank you. says, bravo, breathtaking. Thank you for providing the historical and cultural context. Uh, Dawn says, I owe you a thank you for mentioning the Cleveland Museum's tutor exhibit. We got tickets to the docent-led tour and went last week. We have to go back soon to see more of the art. It is an overwhelming <laughs> museum. Oh, uh, it is. Thank you. I'm glad you did that. Yeah, very good. Di Diana says, exquisite talk. Many thanks. Judy Thank says, you. I visited one Newport cottage many years ago. I would love to visit again. I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so Jane would like to know, yes. do you have a favorite Newport mansion? Yes, thank you for asking, Jane. <laughs> I am um, mostly fond of Marble House. Um, 
I I don't know why. I just, you know, uh, the Breakers is big. Is it too big? I don't know. Uh, but I, I just loved Marble House. I just thought that, um, I thought it was my favorite. Yes, thank you. I'll be moving in shortly as soon as they, um, <laughs> as soon as I can find a way. <laughs> Uh, Julie would like to know, did former President Trump buy one of the mansions? Uh, I have not heard that. Um, I have not heard that. But, uh, you know, it's a it's a good gossipy story and it might be true. Um, Pe people are saying, Julie, people are saying. <laughs> uh, that, that was a joke. Uh, so Pat says, uh, thank you for your presentation. I would love to spend time roaming around without yes. restrictions yes. Uh, and no worries about time. That's uh, right. This, this was amazing and spectacular. And, and, uh, to, and for, yeah, go uh, ahead. I was just going to uh, say for the listeners, that's absolutely right. You you can go at your own. You do not have to be on a guided tour. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, we're going to start to wind down. We'll wrap up yep. in about five minutes. Teresa says, uh, uh, well, actually, uh, Teresa has more praise for you. Frank says this was great. Mary says that um, uh, she would love to see and learn more uh, if you do a part two. Uh, Barbara has similar sentiments. Uh, yep. Allison Allison notes that there's a hop on hop off shuttle that yes. that visits the uh, mansions. Uh, Vicky would like to know: Is the cliff walk still open? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And um, uh, so, yes, if, if for people who don't know, that's a several mile uh, circuitous, nice walk around the edge of the cliffs that takes you along the back of some of these houses in the back of Marble House, the back of the breakers. And um, yes, it's free and open for people to access and you have beautiful views. And like we saw with the breakers, the really prettiest view of the house is from the back. Uh, Interestingly enough, when they instituted that, there was a um, person, it was years and years ago, and there was someone living in one of the big homes, not one of the ones we've talked about today, who was not at all happy that the public could access uh, basically what he considered his uh, part of the land. And he put a wall up and then he they knocked it down and then he put a wall up with glass shards on top and then he put a bull a bull in his back uh, lawn to try to t uh, kind of intimidate visitors, but uh, they are using an old um, statute on the book, which meant that public should always have access to the water, to the water to to be able to keep it. So it is there and it's free. And that old fellow who didn't want visitors is long gone. So um, it's there. <laughs> uh, Robin says thank you. Barb says this was an outstanding morning. Thank you so much. Always terrific presentations, Mary. Thank Many Thank thanks. Thank Edward you. said this was wonderful. Uh, Edward was having computer issues, though. Edward, I will send everyone the recording tomorrow, so um, you should have no issues with the recording. Uh, Julie loved this. Uh, I went to the mansions before the COVID lockdown, so this was Good. a great reminder of their history and beauty. Um, Elaine is not sure about Donald Trump, but she thinks that Jay Leno may have purchased uh, a mansion in Newport recently. Maybe so. There and there are there are lots of them to be had, and um, you'd be surprised that they're not that expensive on the purchase price because <laughs> of the upkeep that you will suddenly have to have. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Adrian asks if there are only six bedrooms. What are generally some of the other rooms? Um, sitting rooms, parlors, uh, the drawing room, the study, yeah, uh, those sorts of things. Um, and that last one, the one, the Elms with just six, the Berwins didn't have any children. And so um, that was another reason why the house was sort of that size is that it was a party house and it was fun, but they didn't really need to accommodate children or grandchildren. So the other rooms are just uh, luxurious uh, sitting rooms and rooms for their art to be in and that type of thing. <laughs> uh, Sam asks, how do you compare these mansions to the uh, Biltmore in Asheville? Yeah. Uh, the, what are your thoughts there? Oh, well, you know, um, the the Biltmore, um, I think I made a note about it in terms of its size, but yeah, it, it's far larger than any of the things that we have seen today. Um, I've been to the Biltmore a lot. Um, I may have mentioned this before, but my, my mother used to work at the Biltmore house and um, uh, it, it's, they're equal, it's equally, they're equally exquisite. Uh, there was a funny comment though about the Biltmore that um, Richard Morris Hunt 
in describing why he had made it uh, so large, uh, or when someone asked, he said, well, it's in it's uh, the mountains were in scale with the house. In other words, rather than the house being in scale of its setting, mm -hmm. um, he made Biltmore huge because it's si situated among these beautiful rolling hills. So, uh, but it's beautiful, absolutely. I and mean, of course, Biltmore has as uh, an added benefit of uh, an, an enormous amount of land around it to to make your beautiful approach. You know, whereas these houses are are very close to the street, some of them, um, but that's okay. Uh, Barb confirms that Jay Leno does have a mansion in Newport. Uh, WGBH filmed uh, there during um, the, their COVID Antiques Roadshow. And a fun <laughs> fact about Jay Leno, Mary, is Jay yeah. Leno grew up in Andover about 10 minutes from where I'm sitting. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, That's he's a local guy. Yeah. I wonder if he has, like, the garage for all of his automobiles planned to be built at his ma Newport mansion, maybe, right? All yeah. right, we're, we're in the lightning round now, Mary. <laughs> okay, Jane quick answer. wants to know, when counting the number of rooms, are those yes. for the servants included? And in which case, what, what's the proportion for the servants? Oh, good question. Um, well, let's see. Uh, yes, those generally, when I say something has uh, 70 rooms, it was maybe the breakers would consider like 30 of them were, or 33 of those rooms were bedrooms for the servants. So um, they had a particularly gracious amount of bedrooms for the servants. So yes, uh, I would say that it's, uh, there are still more public rooms than there are servants spaces, but, uh, but it could be a pretty high number. So 33 staff bedrooms, for instance, that's quite a lot out of 70. Yeah. Uh, Peggy yeah. says that this was a fabulous talk. Uh, her husband, Larry, also went to Furman, where I think you have a degree from. Uh, uh, yes. And Peggy wants to know if you do a talk on Edith Wharton. Oh, no, I haven't yet because I haven't been to the Mount, but that is one of the places, her home out in Western Mass. But it's one of the places I'd love to go. Yeah. Therese, yeah Teresa would amazing. like to know if you do a talk on um, the Biltmore. No, no. Okay. I could. And and then a follow-up to both those questions, an anonymous <laughs> attendee asks, do you have a website listing all the talks that you offer? You are wonderful. Oh, you are very kind. And no, I don't. But, you know, more and more people keep asking. So maybe I need to. Uh, right now, Robert is my agent. <laughs> Pretty much, Mary. And I'm going to get you some good gigs coming up. So, folks, let's give Mary a big virtual round of applause yeah. for a wonderful job this morning. A wonderful 55-minute uh, presentation, and she stuck around for about 20 minutes of questions, did a tremendous job on a very popular topic. We're actually going to see Mary next week. Speaking Yay. of uh, me being your agent and booking you gigs, <laughs> I know. Uh, Mary will be back with us. She's jumping back over to our Art History Series, which is just about every Thursday morning at 1030. And uh, we're going to be seeing Mary next Thursday, uh, May 11th at 1030 for Greek art, a fresh look at ancient art. So it'll be all about Greek art. Yeah, uh, and in, yeah, yeah. yeah, looking forward to that one, Mary. So all our art history programs and all our armchair travel presentations will be in the follow-up email I sent you tomorrow, along with the recording, the feedback survey, and uh, a sheet of references uh, that Mary provided me. So you'll get that all tomorrow morning. Uh, let's give Mary one big last virtual round of applause. Mary, do you have any last words for them? No, thank you. I'll see you next week. All right. I'll see you soon, Mary. Thank you all so much. Uh, thanks again to uh, Ashland and North Reading and thank the you. Friends of the Library and the Corning Foundation. Uh, we'll thanks see you so all much. soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.